I'm setting up the video and I pray that God will bless it and everyone who watches it. What is the lake of fire? Does it point to eternal torment or to annihilation? One of the reasons that many Christians believe that unsaved people will be tormented forever is the lake of fire described in John's vision recorded in Revelation 20. To some people, Revelation 20.10 seems to teach the doctrine of eternal torment. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That sounds like eternal torment. I used to believe in eternal torment, partially based on this verse. But that was before I studied how visions and imagery walk throughout the book of Revelation. Most of the book of Revelation is an inspired account of what John saw in a vision that God gave him. Although the vision includes revelation about the future, it is not like clips from a videotape sent back from the future. Instead, it often uses symbolic images to reveal spiritual reality about our world, including how things will turn out in the end. Some of the symbols in Revelation are shocking and bizarre, like the beast with multiple heads and like a dragon trying to eat a newborn baby. It's pretty obvious that these are symbolic images and not literal depictions. Other symbols are more tame, like incense and fine linen. How do we know that incense and fine linen clothes are symbols? The answer is, we are told. Let's look at how these non-controversial symbols uh, work in John's vision in general before we discuss the lake of fire. Revelation 5.8 and when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. The incense is what John sees in his vision. Prayer is the inspired interpretation of what John saw. So incense is the symbol, and prayer is the meaning. But what if someone got this backwards and they thought, the book of Revelation is telling me that prayer actually means burning incense. So this person, uh, when they go to pray, instead of talking to God and asking God to supply their needs and confessing their sins and, and praising God, instead of doing what people normally do when we pray, uh, this person burns incense. Not only that, but if they read a verse like Colossians 4.2, devote yourselves to prayer, they say, oh, based on the book of Revelation, I know that this means devote yourself to burning incense. Well, that would be backwards. That would be crazy. And thankfully, I don't know anyone who thinks this way or uses the book of Revelation this way when it comes to prayer. Let's think about fine linen, Revelation 19.8. She was given fine linen to wear, bright and pure, for the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. So the fine linen is what John sees in his vision. Righteous acts is the inspired interpretation of what John saw. Fine linen is the simple symbol and righteous acts is the meaning. But what if someone got this backwards? And they said, oh, based on the book of Revelation, I now know that if I want to do righteous acts, what that means is I need to wear fine linen clothes. So this confused person, um, instead of loving their neighbors and helping widows and orphans and trying to obey God's commands, instead of those things, this person just wears fine linen clothes. And if they read a verse like this one, uh, so her husband Joseph, being a righteous man, when they read that, they say, oh, based on the book of Revelation, I know what that means. That means Joseph wore fine linen clothes, and I want to be righteous, so I'm going to wear fine linen clothes. Well, that would be backwards. That would be crazy. And thankfully, I don't know anyone who interprets 
the fine linen and righteous acts in this backwards method. Now, let's think about what the uh, book of Revelation says about the lake of fire. It follows the same pattern as the incense and as the fine linen. Uh, actually, it interprets the lake of fire for us not once, but twice. Revelation 20, 14, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death, Revelation 21, 8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. For simplicity, we'll focus on just first, uh, Revelation 20:14. Um, so the lake of fire is what John sees in his vision. And second death is the inspired interpretation of what John saw. The lake of fire is the symbol. The second death is the meaning. But what if people got this backwards and they think, oh, the book of Revelation has told me that to die a second time actually means that people will be kept alive and tormented forever in a lake of fire. They have to be kept alive to be tormented because you can't torment someone who's dead. Have you ever tried to torment a dead body? It doesn't work at all. So they think, now I know what, what second death means. It means to be tormented forever in the lake of fire. And then if they read a, a, a verse like Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Even though this verse indicates that death is the opposite of eternal life. Even though this verse strongly implies that the wages of sin does not involve living forever, uh, the person who has this backwards interpretation of Revelation says, hold on a minute. Based on the book of Revelation, I know that somehow death actually means being kept alive and tormented forever in the lake of fire. So they interpret this verse and similar verses in the Bible in this way, that would be backwards. But tragically, people actually do translate and interpret this part of Revelation backwards. In other words, the common view that the unrighteous will be eternally tormented in hell is partially based on a backwards reading of the lake of fire imagery seen in John's vision in Revelation 20. Now, sledding backwards may be fun, but the backwards interpretation of the lake of fire imagery in Revelation 20 has resulted in a view of hell, namely eternal torment, that understandably deeply disturbs many people. It has contributed to many atheists rejecting belief in God, to many who once confessed faith in Christ deconstructing their faith and losing it, uh, to many moving from a solid biblical form of Christianity to a progressive uh, liberal versions that are barely, if at all, still truly Christian, and to many Christians feeling deep distress and confusion. These are some of the negative results. They don't always happen, but sometimes they have this effect on people when they think about the, 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 the wrong doctrine of eternal torment that is based on a backwards reading of the imagery in Revelation. Now, before finishing, I want to respond to another point of confusion regarding the lake of fire and the second death. The simplest and most common meaning of death, both in the Bible and in everyday usage all around the world, is that it refers to the loss of life, which of course includes the loss of consciousness. Now, uh, when somebody dies in this life, uh, their body dies and their body is no longer conscious. Uh, but uh, I believe that the soul continues to live. The soul is conscious, but the part that's dead, the body is not. Loss of life. That's the simple meaning of death. Everybody knows it in everyday life. But some Christians think that instead of meaning simply loss of life, the word death here means something like separation from God. We can test these competing meanings for death by looking at the first time the phrase second death is used in the Bible. 
Here it is back in Revelation chapter 2, not 20, but back in chapter 2, the second death is used for the first time. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Jesus is speaking here to Christians in the church of Smyrna. And Jesus says, I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. It doesn't make sense at all for death to mean something like being separated from God here. Jesus would never say, be faithful until you're separated from God. That, that doesn't make sense. It makes sense for death to have its normal, simple meaning of loss of life. Now let's continue to read verse 11. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Why would the Christians in Smyrna think that death has a radically different meaning in the very next verse, in verse 11 compared to verse 10, especially when the normal meaning fits the context perfectly fine. Jesus is telling them at the second judgment, you will not, at the judgment, I'm sorry, at the judgment, the final judgment, you will not die a second time. Instead, you will live forever. Let's sum up what we've seen so far. Jesus see, uh, excuse me, John sees a lake of fire in a vision. This is interpreted for us to mean second death. And second death is confirmed to mean simply losing life a second time. But is the second death like people's first death in every way? There are two ways that the second death is different. Matthew 10.28 says, Don't fear those who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So the first way is different. The first death only affects the body, but the second death will destroy both the bodies and souls of the unsaved. 2 Thessalonians 1.9 They will pay the penalty of eternal destruction from the Lord's presence and from his glorious strength. So the second difference is this. The first death ends at the resurrection. When people die the first time, they don't stay dead forever. They're resurrected, and that includes both the righteous and the unrighteous. But those who suffer the second death will remain dead forever. They are eternally destroyed, and of course that rules out the possibility of universalism. Now, none of this changes the basic meaning of death. Death still means the loss of life. The difference is that in the second death, both the soul and body will lose life, and this loss of life is permanent, it will never be reversed, it is everlasting. So, John's vision of the lake of fire, which is interpreted in the Bible itself as the second death, points to annihilation, not to eternal torment. When we use annihilation in this context, talking about a doctrine, we simply mean the permanent death, the permanent loss of life, which of course includes the loss of consciousness, of all of, a, of the whole person, body and soul, and that remains forever. That's what that's the way annihilation is is used theologically. Um, but why then does John's vision of the lake of fire include seeing the devil, the beast, and the false prophet being tormented forever? A few quick thoughts about this. One, while the lake of fire as a whole is interpreted for us as the second death. This specific part of the lake of fire vision is not interpreted for us. So we should be careful and humble. And there are other symbols in the, uh, other imagery in the book of Revelation that's not interpreted for us. And people have all kinds of opinions about what it means, like the locusts, for example. So we should be careful and humble. Point two, this, this being tormented day and night forever and ever, only applies to these three beings the devil, the beast, and the false prophet. We don't know if any of these three beings are humans. The devil definitely is not human. The beast and the false prophet could be some kind of demonic beings that were controlling people or controlling events that were behind the scene. Or um, I think that they could represent, the beast could represent 
evil human government that opposed the gospel and persecuted Christians, and the false prophet could uh, uh, be a symbol for a false religion uh, that deceives people and leads them astray. Um, but I will admit it is possible. I don't think it is likely, but it is possible based on this verse that the devil and demonic beings will be tormented forever. Annihilate The doctrine of conditional immortality and annihilationism is not about what happens to the devil and demons. It's about what happens to people. But I think, even for the devil and demons, I think it is more likely that this is an example of hyperbole in a symbolic image. Revelation uses hyperbolic imagery and language elsewhere, uh, so I... So it might be using it uh, here. So in other words, this is hyperbole. And what it means is that uh, even though the devil and all his demons will eventually be totally destroyed, that the process might be long and terrible and full of torment for them, the process of being destroyed. I think that's a, a possible interpretation of that specific part of this one verse. Now, Understanding that the lake of fire is an image that points to annihilation helps us to see how Revelation 20 harmonizes with the many other Bible passages, words, and doctrines that all support annihilationism, which is also known as conditional immortality. I'm going to read this again, but show you some things as I read it. Understanding that the lake of fire is an image that points to annihilation helps us to see how Revelation 20 harmonizes with the many other Bible passages. And here's a bunch of Bible passages that all support annihilationism and conditional immortality. Words like Apollomi, Katakaio, Teprao, Aphanizo, those are all Greek words that if you study them, uh, they point to and support the doctrine of annihilationism. And doctrines, like the doctrine of the final state, how everything's going to be in the end, uh, everything united in harmony with God in the end, with no evil left at all, that supports annihilationism. The atonement, Jesus died for us, so it makes sense that those who are not saved, that finally, in the end, eventually, they will die, they will perish. And the goodness and justice of God fits with annihilationism much better, much better than with eternal torment. So, a few closing pastoral thoughts. I hope and pray that all who are watching this will believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior so that you may have the gift of eternal life and not perish in the terrible lake of fire. This is a big deal. People who perish are going to miss out on eternity with Jesus on eternity in a perfect world with people who will love one another. And, and the process of perishing might be uh, uh, unpleasant, to put it mildly. Uh, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, even though the weeping and gnashing of teeth will not go on forever. It's a big, big deal. Uh, it's very important for people to be saved, and I pray that everybody who's watching this video uh, either is or will be saved through faith in Jesus. Number two, I also pray that God will strengthen and guide you to use the gifts he gives you to work together with other Christians to help reach our neighbors near and far so that they will come to faith in Christ and gain eternal life. And number three, I also pray that God will guide you if you choose to study this topic further. The most important resource is your Bible. Uh, God also uses other Christians to help us understand the Bible. And so I've prepared links to more resources on conditional immortality and the nature of hell. You can find these links in the uh, video description below this video on YouTube. Okay, and now I am closing out the video and I pray that God will bless everybody who has watched it.